What's up guys? In this episode, we'll be talking about value creation and the control founders have over their startup. You need to give away some control to build something value. How much is up to you though? If you want to know more, stick with me right now. Ask Alex. Ask Alex. Because you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't know, now you know. Yeah. Founders and CEOs, let me ask you a question. Does the degree to which you have founder control of your startup affect your company value? I'm pretty sure your answer to this is simple and resounding. Yes, I am good for my company. I am what makes it valuable, and that will continue to be the case so long as I have breath to run things. Well, it seems you can't have your cake and eat it too. That is a question Noam Wasserman, former uh, professor at Harvard Business School, asked himself. He's published a paper that finds startups where founders retain control of the startup after three years are in fact worth less. It seems founding CEOs are bad news for making big, viable companies. Well, the headline, anyway. So what are the findings? He analyzed a data set of 6,130 American startups between 2005 and 2012, and found that the startups in which there is still found in control of the board of directors um, or the CEO positions are significantly less viable than those in which the founder has given up control. On average, each additional level of founder control, i.e. controlling the board and or the CEO position, reduces the pre-money valuation of the startup by 17.1 to 22%. This is especially true when the startup is three years old or more. That's pretty scary, indeed, if you believe the results. Academics are known to massage numbers to get profound results, but there isn't smoke without fire. Resources underpin growth and valuation. The paper is quite interesting as there is a great review of literature if you're academically inclined, but it can get a little long-winded. So the underlying point I believe is being made in the paper is, in short, the more resources you have, the more valuable your company is going to be, and with more certainty. If you don't ask for help, your startup is less likely to win or survive. The more resources that a new venture can gain control of, and the quicker it can do so, the better the venture's competitive position, and the more valuable the venture can become. There is a causation between more resources and less control. This control dilemma highlights how founders, despite their best intentions, can make decisions that limit the value of the company they created, or else can risk losing control of their companies. In making resource decisions, founders thus trade off resource uncertainty for control uncertainty. Decisions that can lead to a big company require all giving away control. If you start a company with experienced, high-quality co-founders, they get equity. If you hire top management, they get equity. Attracting resources into a fledging venture is perhaps the greatest challenge faced by entrepreneurs. If you raise money to grow faster, you get investors dilution and give board seats, etc. Basically, everything that one increases rate of growth and two mitigates the chance of failure means giving away equity. Why did you start up? Why are you setting up a company? Is it for the earnings? Not likely. On average, the earnings of self-employed entrepreneurs were lower both initially and over time than the earnings of those engaged in paid employment, despite the common assumption that it's the profit motive that attracts them to the challenge of building new organizations. Is it more likely to be the big cheese? More likely. Entrepreneurs may trade lower earnings for the non-pecuniary benefits of business ownership, such as being their own boss, being able to implement the founder's strategies. I posit that the boss is the key driver, or rather, not having a crappy boss. But I don't think that is so simple. At some point, founders also want to make money. Once you realize you're onto something, evident by traction, ceding control to gain utility or building a legacy can and probably does take over. Good founders get out of their own way to be successful. What helped a founder build something meaningfully um, naturally enables them to realize at some point that they need help to go farther. The Google gang brought in Herr Schmidt, Zuck brought in Cheryl, and Bill got bored, and we got stuck with Steve, who then actually we got a pretty good CEO of Microsoft now, but anyway. And ultimately, you know, Microsoft had a decade of crappy products. 
Now, having said that, jobs with booted out only to return. If you want to bring in these guys, it's gonna cost you though. But in the same way, families that can get out of their own way manifest their own destiny, or for this analysis, lower valuations. Each step of the entrepreneurial resource attraction journey poses a trade-off between attracting the resources required to build a company uh, and its value and being able to retain control of decision-making. High quality co-founders and non-founding hires should demand more equity and or decision rights than will lesser co-founders and hires. I don't think this is the bone of contention for founders, rather the perceived and actual seeding control happens from investment, which is ipso facto required in most cases to enable the aforementioned resources. Now is value creation and uh, is valuation and value creation worth seeding founder control? For small endeavors, angel investors contribute a modicum of funding for little control, but the money only goes so far. From tiny acorns does a, uh, does a sapling make? To go far from a mother load of ECs does an oak make? The same is true of investors who can add the most value compared to lower value investors. Such investors want both to own a stake in their venture, to gain from its growth and value, and to protect their investments by having decision rights and influence through a board presence. This is one reason why a lot of uh, angels don't do convertible notes. Um, former president of SoftBank, um, we were pitching for some money, was interested, but he said, I'm not doing convertible notes. I want to know how much I own, right? In essence, the interests of the entrepreneur and of the investor can diverge because the investor cares about financial returns while the entrepreneur gets the benefits of control. Each round of investment gives growth fuel to try and increase valuation in return for diminishing control. As founders give up equity and board seats in order to attract investors, the founder's percentage of board seats progressively decreases until the point where the founder are a minority of board members and there's no longer dominance of inside over outside directors on the board. So at what point of the scale between investment and founder control are you happy with? There comes a point at which if valuation does not increase out of line with dilution, that further dilution does not lead to proportional increase in founder promote the dollar value of shares at the last valuation. So if you're raising more money and effectively getting poorer, the VC uh, raise game is fine if you're tending to go big or go bust. If you get monster valuation, your promote will be worth a lot. Otherwise, you're giving both your company, financial upside, and control away. It is possible to build a large bootstrap company. There have been some recent examples of success stories. The reality at some point, they all see final control and sell or go public, like Atlassian did. The difference between uh, the founders typically have control of the decisions to do so and own most of the company as well, which is pretty nice. The worst outcomes are for less judicious founders who work hard, no doubt, but have been less efficient, addicted to VC funding and their model not being optimal, either capital inefficient, requiring substantial scale to be viable, etc results in the founders being severely diluted. I'm not saying this is the case for them, but Aaron Levy, founder of Box, owned about 4% of Box um, when it had its IPO in 2015. Zendesk founder and CEO uh, Mikkel Svana owned 8% at its IPO in 2014. And Exact Target's co-founder owned 3.8% at the time the company filed its S1. At 4 to 8%, you aren't really in control anymore. And so going IPO is a nice way to put some uh, things in bed in some ways, right? Now, to include this, the motivations for setting up a company, how companies are run, and how they end are all deeply personal. Founders should think judiciously about what their personal goals are and therefore their choices that they make. If you want full founder control, a lifestyle business, it's great for you. If you have a bit more of an ego or simply just like bigger things, then the VC path, whilst not the only path, is likely the one you will follow. Each will result in different levels of control. What is clear to me though is, you can't build anything with meaningful value creation without giving up some control. How much? Well, that's up to you. Okay guys, if you really enjoyed that, please like, share, etc. I'd really appreciate it. 
If you are struggling with your startup or your VC firm and you love to work with me, then I do consulting and I can help you out. Please reach out to me on my site and we'll chat. See you guys, bye.